Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight's episode, Compelling Reasons to Doubt Mormonism. Well, as most of you know, I was baptized into the LDS Church fresh out of high school back in June of 1978. And being a good, faithful, Latter-day Saint boy, I signed up for a mission. I received my mission call to Kobe, Japan in the summer of 1979 and reported for duty at the MTC, yes, the Missionary Training Center in Provo, Utah in November of 1979. I was there for two months because I was going to a foreign speaking mission and I had to learn not only all the ins and outs of how to be a good missionary, but also how to speak the Japanese language. In January of 1980, I and the rest of the guys in my district at the MTC, all of whom of course were Japan bound, boarded a plane at Salt Lake City Airport and flew up to SeaTac Airport where we had a connecting flight on a 747 across the Pacific and landing in Narita Airport. From there, we got transported to the mission home in Kobe, where I met President Thomas Stout and received my first assignment and my first missionary companion. The first assignment was way up in the mountains of Japan in a little place called Fukuchiyama. And my first mission companion was Kyle S. McKay. Now, little did I know at the time that there existed a companionship in Japan, of myself and Elder Kyle McKay, one of whom would go on to become the church historian, and the other one would go on to become Radio Free Mormon. Kyle McKay was my senior companion. He was the trainer companion, being the first companion that I had on my mission. And I've got to tell you, he was a great guy and a great missionary. To give you a taste for Kyle McKay, he had been the captain and the quarterback of his football team, at Bountiful High School, as well as the student body president. So you can tell right away, he's athletic, he's charismatic, he's good-looking, he's popular. And I think we got along famously. But 40 years goes by, Kyle goes his way, I go mine, he ends up becoming the church historian, I end up becoming RFM, and on April 25th of this year, April 25th of 2023, Kyle McKay, my former missionary companion, shows up at BYU-Idaho to give a devotional address and ends up giving what is perhaps the most controversial talk that's been given by any LDS church leader in recent memory. So I set myself down to do a commentary and a breakdown analysis of this talk by Kyle McKay, and I did so by listening to his talk a number of times until I had the structure mapped out on paper as well as in my mind, made several pages of notes, and then came down to the studio yesterday on Saturday, May 6th of 2023, with the goal in mind of completing the podcast. I got up at 6 o'clock in the morning. I was down at the studio by 7 o'clock in the morning, and I wasn't back to the apartment until 6 o'clock that night, and I still wasn't done. I could not believe how time-consuming this process was and how much there was that Kyle said in his talk that I felt compelled to respond to. But now it is Sunday, May 7th, 2023. I'm back in the studio. I'm finishing this up. And I hope that all the work I've put into producing this particular podcast will translate into listener enjoyment. I've been thinking about why it is that it took me so long to respond to this talk by Kyle McKay. And I finally came up with the image in my head that it's like when you're going out fishing with somebody and they manage to get a huge snarl at the end of their fishing rod. All I know is it takes a lot more work to untie and untangle that snarl than it did for Kyle to create it in the first place. I want to stop right now for a second and thank all of the many listeners who have taken the time to go to RadioFreeMormon.org and donate to the program. As many of you know, I am no longer taking cases as a practicing attorney. I have transitioned from the practice of law to the practice of podcasting. So when I say that your donations keep Radio Free Mormon broadcasting behind enemy lines, I'm not kidding. Your donations are what I depend upon to pay the bills and put food on the table. If you have not yet donated to Radio Free Mormon, I urge you to go to RadioFreeMormon.org right now, click on the donate button and make a modest donation, hopefully a monthly recurring donation. $5 is all that I ask for my listeners. 
Five dollars a month is a recurring donation. If you could do ten dollars, if you could do twenty dollars a month, so much the better. But five dollars a month is all that I'm asking for. And I assure you that your donations definitely do keep Radio Free Mormon broadcasting behind enemy lines. So with that said, let's get on to Kyle McKay's talk from BYU, Idaho, April 25th, 2023, and the commentary from Radio Free Mormon, Kyle's former missionary companion from January of 1980. Elder Kyle S. McKay was sustained as a General Authority 70 on March 31st, 2018. For those of you who think I might have grabbed the wrong recording by mistake, no, this is not a funeral. This is actually Henry J. Eyring, son of Henry B. Eyring, who also happens, coincidentally, to be the president of BYU-Idaho, who is giving the introduction for the speaker at a BYU-Idaho devotional. At the time of his call, he had been serving as a member of the Fifth Quorum of the Seventy in the Utah North area. He is the church historian and recorder and executive director of the church history department. He also serves on the scripture committee. Wow, that is really impressive. My old missionary companion is now the church historian. And Henry J. Eyring, as part of his introduction, is going to tell us about all of his qualifications for that job. Elder McKay received a Bachelor of Arts degree in English from Brigham Young University in 1984. Okay, so Kyle didn't have anything to do with history as an undergrad. He probably got his master's degree in history, though, right? In 1987, he received a Juris Doctor degree from Brigham Young University. Well, I guess he didn't get his master's degree in history either, just law. But I'll bet he leveraged his law degree to go into a career in history where he learned all the things he needed to become the church historian. From 1987 to 2018, Elder McKay practiced law in Oregon and Utah. So apparently Kyle McKay's career has nothing to do with history either. He has a BA in English from BYU. He's got a JD in law from BYU. He's got 20 years practicing as a lawyer. Sure, why not make him the next church historian? Elder McKay has served in a number of church callings. Oh wait, I spoke too soon. It must be his church callings that gave him experience in history. Including full-time missionary in the Japan Kobe mission. Now, Kyle McKay's missionary experience doesn't give him any background in history, but it is where I met him and where we were mission companions in the Kobe, Japan mission back in January of 1980. Elders Quorum President. No history there. Ward Young Men President. No history there. High Counselor. No history there. Counselor in a stake presidency. No history there. And a stake president. Okay, never mind. Apparently, Kyle McKay didn't get any background in the study of history in his church callings either. Kyle Sterling McKay was born in Chicago, Illinois on February 14th, 1960. Which actually ends up making him just about one month older than I am. He married Jennifer Stone in 1984. They're the parents of nine children. At this point, there is a break in the audio of the recording, apparently to skip over the song that was presumably sung by the choir before President, excuse me, not President McKay, but church historian Kyle McKay speaks. Kyle McKay is related, of course, to President David O. McKay. My understanding is that Kyle is the grandson of President McKay's brother. Kyle McKay's voice is the next voice we will hear. Thank you. That was just a powerful testimony of Jesus Christ. I appreciate that warm and generous introduction as well. Jennifer and I are truly honored and just overjoyed to be with you here today. With you, I loved listening to President and Sister Eyring speak last week. I adore President and Sister Kimball. He was the prophet of my youth, and I marvel at their faith and their perseverance. And Sister Eyring, right now I am living one of those paradoxes you talked about. I feel both at home in your presence and uncomfortably intimidated in your presence. This is so because you remind me of my children. The wife of the university president reminds you of your children? 
I honestly don't know what you're thinking here, Kyle, but here's a brief memo from me to you. When you're next speaking at a university, try not to insult the university president's wife right out of the chute. Just a small tweak that could improve your overall performance. And not only that, are we really supposed to be taking your words at face value? Are you really meaning what it is you're saying? If so, then we're left with the inescapable conclusion that you're telling the audience that you are intimidated by your own children. Not a good look. We have nine children, as was mentioned. Many of them I know by name. (laughs) And when, when our oldest was 14 years old, we have seven boys and two girls, she came to me and cornered me one day after work in tears, in panic, and in desperation. Okay, at least you're going to explain to us why it is that the wife of the university president reminds you of your children. Apparently, it's this 14-year-old girl that she reminds you of. She said, Dad, I don't try to be smarter than you and Mom. I just am. (laughs) She said it shouldn't be this way, but it is. Okay, Kyle, this is another place where I don't understand if I'm supposed to be taking you seriously. If I'm not taking you seriously, and it is supposed to be a joke, and it sounds like it's supposed to be a joke, and your 14-year-old daughter really does not know more than you know, but it's something that a 14-year-old girl would say, then are you saying that that's why your 14-year-old daughter reminds you of the wife of Henry J. Eyring? Because she thinks she knows more than you, but it's really a joke because obviously she doesn't. Or if you're being serious, then your 14-year-old girl reminds you of Henry J. Eyring's wife because she actually does know more than you. If that's the case, then what you're saying is that when your daughter was 14, she really did know more than anybody in the family, including you. A little clarity here would be helpful. Well, imagine her panic knowing that at some point in life, maybe even then, she would need counsel from someone and the people to whom she would naturally turn are dumber than she is. So that's who they sent you here today. Oh, I get it now. You're using the story, Kyle, to establish some kind of faux humility. You're saying that when your daughter was 14, she really did know more than you. And sorry that my 14-year-old daughter knows more than I did as an adult, but that's the person they sent to you. So I guess you're just going to have to put up with whatever it is I'm going to say, even though I don't know more than my 14-year-old daughter. I am uh, have been praying for you and about this message, and I pray now that the opening prayer will be answered, that the message that God has given me might somehow be carried to your heart and be safely and gently but firmly planted there, that it might remain there. The problem, Kyle, with now turning around and wanting the students to take your message seriously is that you've just gotten done establishing that you don't know more than your own daughter knew when she was 14 years old. Why should anybody take what you have to say seriously when you've just established that you're a big dummy? Now, obviously, I know that you're not a dummy. You're just using the story to establish humility and rapport with the audience. But the problem is, is that the way you use the story immediately establishes that you were only kidding about being humble, about not knowing more than your 14-year-old daughter. This was total kabuki theater. You don't believe that about yourself at all. So why are you trying to get the audience to believe that about you unless you were trying to say that in some manner this story presents you as a humble follower of Jesus Christ whose words should be taken seriously. Unfortunately, this brief introduction and story serves as a template for the rest of Kyle's talk because it doesn't get better from here. It actually gets worse. It is inherently contradictory and full of confusing and illogical and irrational statements. In short, Kyle is just warming up. In May of last year, President Nelson spoke to you the young adults of the church, saying, quote, You must own your own conversion. No one else can do it for you. I plead with you to take charge of your testimony. Close quote. A few months later, he extended the same invitation to the entire church. So Kyle starts with a quote from President Nelson saying that every member of the church now has to take charge of their own conversion and their own testimony because God knows the leaders of the church aren't going to be helping you with that anymore. I hope you're acting upon this invitation, that you're owning your own conversion and taking charge of your own testimony. Over the years, as I have sought to solidify my own testimony, 
I have been moved by the words and quest of another modern-day prophet. To the young people of his day, President Joseph F. Smith declared, quote, I'm not sure why Kyle is quoting the words of a prophet who's a hundred years in the grave, especially after last general conference when we found out that my comic book collection is more valuable over time than the words of past prophets. But here we go. From my boyhood, I have desired to learn the principles of the gospel in such a way and to such an extent that it would matter not to me who might fall from the truth, who might make a mistake, who might fail to continue to follow the example of the Master, my foundation would be sure and certain in the truths that I have learned." Close quote. If you pay close attention, you will notice that Joseph F. Smith mentions three categories of people who are not going to be allowed to affect his testimony. The first are those who leave the church, the second are those who make mistakes, and the third are those who do not continue to follow the example of Jesus Christ. Interestingly, Kyle will go on to use this quote, but only use the first two categories of that quote, i.e. those who leave the church and those who commit mistakes. He's going to leave completely alone in his subsequent discussion any mention of church leaders not following the example of Christ. And now that I think of it, there's probably a good reason he's not going to go there. This quote from Joseph F. Smith now sets Kyle up to make the most mind-boggling admission that I have ever heard any church leader make. He is going to compare the reasons and the evidence to doubt Mormonism is true with the reasons and the evidence to believe that Mormonism is true, and he's going to call those reasons to doubt whether Mormonism is true compelling reasons to doubt. Indeed, this quote forms the title for tonight's show, Compelling Reasons to Doubt Mormonism. This isn't me saying it. This is the church historian. Is your testimony of Jesus Christ and his restored gospel strengthened by but not dependent on others? Is your foundation sure and certain enough that you can remain unshaken even if someone you admire in the faith makes a mistake now or in the future or in the past? Okay, we haven't gotten to the money quote yet, but before we get there, I have to insert myself here to make a couple of comments on what Kyle just said. He is challenging his audience to continue to have faith in spite of mistakes, and that's with huge air quotes around it, mistakes that church leaders have made now or in the future, and then he says significantly, or in the past. Well, when he's talking about now, he's got to be talking about the SEC scandal where the first presidency of the church was caught red-handed filing false documents with the Securities and Exchange Commission over a period of 20 years. The church got fined $5 million for that. $4 million of the fine was apportioned to the Enzyme Peak Advisors investment account that the church has, and $1 million of that was specifically assigned to the church itself because the first presidency of the church was up to its eyeballs in that fiasco. That's got to be what Kyle means when he says mistakes that leaders of the church have made now. He then goes into the future and he says, do you have faith enough to survive any mistakes that leaders of the church might make in the future? Well, a rational mind would probably say, well, Kyle, I guess it depends on what those mistakes that the church leaders are going to make in the future actually are. Are they simple little mistakes that don't challenge my testimony? Or are they big-ass mistakes like this whole SEC scandal that's going to rock my testimony and the testimony of thousands of Latter-day Saints to their core? But here, Kyle is, of course, tacitly admitting that there is no mistake that church leaders could make in the future or at any other time that would be of such enormity that it should have any effect on any member's testimony. That seems an extreme position to take, and yet it is the one that Kyle has staked out for himself. And then, after covering the present and the future, Kyle says significantly, or in the past. Are you going to let any of those mistakes that church leaders made in the past challenge your testimony? Well, he's not going to talk about what those mistakes were, but we know what they are. Everybody who listens to this program knows what they are. And they go from Joseph Smith's practice of polygamy, his treasure digging, his translation of the Book of Mormon with a stone in a hat, It goes up through the temple and priesthood ban on black people that was instituted by Brigham Young and continued for 10 consecutive prophets after that until President Kimball 
the profit of Kyle's youth as well as mine, reversed it in 1978? Or might it have to do with the mistakes that the church leaders are continuing to make today with their position on gays and transgender people and assigning them a status of inferiority in the LDS church? Are these some of the mistakes that Kyle is talking about? It's hard to tell because he's never going to mention them. But now we're all set up for the money quote. Here we go. If you haven't listened to anything so far, pay attention to this. Is your knowledge and testimony of truth strong enough that you can stare down compelling reasons to doubt and choose to believe? Have you learned the gospel, the principles of the gospel, in such a way that you can do all this? Stop the presses. Stop the presses. Kyle McKay just said that there are compelling reasons to doubt Mormonism. And he said it when he asked the rhetorical question, do you have enough faith to stare down compelling reasons to doubt? He didn't say allegedly compelling reasons to doubt. He didn't say so-called compelling reasons to doubt. He flat out said compelling reasons to doubt. Now, Kyle is no dummy. In spite of that story he told about his 14-year-old daughter at the beginning of his talk, he's no dummy. He's been through law school. He's been a practicing attorney for 20 years. He is no dummy. And as an attorney, he knows what the word compelling means because it is used frequently in legal circles. A compelling argument is by definition an argument that commands your assent. It means that you have to agree with it. Compelling means to force somebody. The power of Christ compels you. I did a TikTok on this the other day, and there were some people who were saying, no, you're misinterpreting that. That's not really what compelling means. So I went and looked it up, and guess what? Here's what it means, and I'm looking it up again right now from the Oxford Languages Dictionary. Here's the definition of compelling. Evoking interest, attention, or admiration in a powerfully irresistible way. See, it's compelling. It's irresistible. Second entry, not able to be refuted, inspiring conviction. So a compelling argument is one that cannot be refuted. Third definition, not able to be resisted, overwhelming. That's what compelling means, all of those things. And that's exactly what Kyle McKay just said, the reasons to doubt Mormonism are. They are compelling reasons to doubt. And his rhetorical question is, of course, do you have enough faith to stare down compelling reasons to doubt and continue to choose to believe? All I can say is that the ability to stare down compelling reasons to doubt and continue to believe something different than what the compelling reasons tell you is the truth, that's called a mental disorder. But it seems that that is what Kyle McKay is urging upon the members of the church. He wants them to suffer from a mental disorder. He wants them to believe a proposition in spite of compelling reasons to not believe that proposition. If you take nothing else away from this talk by Kyle McKay, that is the one nugget that I have never heard before from any church leader, and I don't expect to ever hear it again, but who knows? And some people have said, well, you know, Kyle McKay, he's not one of the apostles, so it doesn't really count when he says it. Hey, look, Kyle McKay is a general authority. Kyle McKay is uniquely positioned to know what he's talking about because he's the church historian. If the church historian, who presumably is aware of all the problems in church history, if the church historian says there are compelling reasons to doubt Mormonism, you can believe him. In the spring of 1837, for reasons that seemed legitimate to him, Apostle Parley P. Pratt turned his back on the Prophet Joseph Smith and tried to take others with him, including a young convert from Canada whom Parley had taught and baptized just one year earlier. This is one of those stories that everybody familiar with church history knows is John Taylor. He's the Canadian convert. Yeah, we all know this. But it's going to be a story where, in typical Mormon fashion, he's going to hold back the name of the Canadian convert and then spring it on the audience as a big surprise when he gets to the climax of the story. More importantly, though, 
Also, anybody who knows anything about church history is going to have a red flag go up when Kyle McKay mentions that Parley P. Pratt left the church in 1837. The red flag is that almost certainly Parley Pratt left over the scandal involving the Kirtland Bank. I know that was my immediate thought when I heard him say it the first time, and I did some research on it, and sure enough, that's exactly why it was that Parley P. Pratt left the church. Kyle says that for, I'm sure, what Parley thought were good reasons. He left the church and tried to take other people with him. Well, I want to stop at this point to share with you the research I did because I was never really quite clear on why it was that Parley P. Pratt left the church. Now, we know he came back shortly thereafter, and yet, why was it that Parley Pratt left the church? Again, Kyle is going to tell us that he's sure that Parley thought he had good reasons for it, but Kyle is not going to share with his audience the reasons that Parley had for leaving the church and trying to take other people away from the church as well. So here's the thumbnail version of my review of the history on this subject. Parley P. Pratt, who was not just any rank-and-file member of the church at this point, this is 1837, he's already a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He's a big deal. Now, what Joseph Smith ended up doing to Parley Pratt isn't something that would be okay if Joseph Smith did it to some rank-and-file member that he didn't know, but this is a guy that Joseph Smith talked to on a regular basis and rubbed shoulders with. He knows Parley P. Pratt, and he knows him well. And yet, from Parley P. Pratt's point of view, this is what happened. In 1837, there are two gathering places, one in Missouri and one in Kirtland, Ohio. We all know this. Joseph Smith managed to buy up, probably on the credit of the church, a lot of the property in Kirtland, Ohio, to which place the revelations of God said the saints should gather. Now, when you're getting a revelation from God that saints should gather to one place, that makes a lot of sense because you can do a lot of things as a unit or as a gathered group or body that you can't do if everybody's scattered everywhere. That part makes sense, but there's a danger here. And that danger is that if you happen to be the guy who's receiving the revelations to tell people to gather to a certain location, and you're also the same guy who owns the property or a lot of the property at that location where you're telling the people to gather and buy a property, well, that can easily turn into an exploitation of the saints. And that appears to be what happened with Joseph Smith and other members of the church, and specifically Parley P. Pratt. From Parley Pratt's point of view, he moved himself and his family to Kirtland. He bought three plots of land in Kirtland, which I imagine were contiguous, and he built his house on the land. And he had to buy the land from Joseph Smith because Joseph Smith is the one who owns all the property, remember? He bought this land from Joseph Smith for the inflated sum of two thousand dollars. Now, from Parley Pratt's point of view, Joseph Smith bought this land for one hundred dollars, all three plots, one hundred dollars, and then inflated it to two thousand dollars when it came time to sell it to his apostle, Parley Pratt. Parley Pratt paid the two thousand dollars, but he doesn't have two thousand dollars to pay for land, so he does it in the form of a promissory note to Joseph Smith, i.e., I, Parley Pratt, owe Joseph Smith $2,000, and then there's a payment agreement in the note to pay off that debt. Well, of course, Parley Pratt can't make the payments. He gets behind. He wants some help from Joseph Smith. He wants a little Christian help and charity, especially when he bought this property for 20 times more than Joseph Smith bought it for in the first place. What does Joseph Smith do? Well, according to a letter Parley Pratt wrote, to Joseph Smith, and which can be found on the Joseph Smith Papers Project. When Parley Pratt got in trouble with not being able to pay the note to Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith took the promissory note, gave it to the bank, presumably then took the $2,000 face value on the promissory note in cash from the bank, and then the Kirtland Bank foreclosed on Parley Pratt's house, leaving him and his family without a place to live. This is the experience Parley Pratt had, and this is why he felt he had Good reason to leave the church. And now you know the rest of the story. Going on with Kyle McKay's talk. In your mind, I want you to think of someone who has been instrumental in bringing you unto Christ and strengthening your testimony. What if that person reached out to you personally and announced his or her departure from the church and tried to persuade you to leave? Would it rattle you? 
How would you respond? Some of you have already been faced with this. Here, Kyle McKay inadvertently tips his hand and reveals why it is he's giving this particular talk to this particular group of people. The group of people are young adults. They are students at BYU-Idaho. And now he's talking to them and saying that many of them have probably had this experience already of friends or significant people in their lives, strong members of the church, leaving the church and then reaching out to them and trying to persuade them to leave the church as well. This is a phenomenal moment in church history. Not only are they acknowledging that people are leaving the church like rats off a sinking ship, but also trying to address the problem of what do we do when those people who leave the church try and get other members to go with them. That is the reason that Kyle is giving this talk. And ironically, ironically, he's going back to 1837 and the Kirtland banking fiasco crisis when a majority of the 12 apostles left the church and people were leaving the church in droves. Remember, this is the point in time when back around 2010, the church historian then, Elder Marlon Jensen, said publicly that they had never seen so much apostasy among the members of the church in 2010 in all of church history since the days of Kirtland. That's what he's talking about. The apostasy and all the people who left the church in Kirtland in 1837 over this banking crisis fiasco. Here's how that young Canadian convert responded. Quote, I'm surprised to hear you speak so, Brother Parley. Before you left Canada, you bore a strong testimony to Joseph Smith being a prophet of God and to the truth of the work he has inaugurated. And you said you knew these things by revelation and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, Brother Parley, it is not man that I am following, but the Lord. The principles you taught me led me to Him, and I now have the same testimony that you then rejoiced in. If the work was true six months ago, it is true today. If Joseph was then a prophet, he is now a prophet. Close quote. Here, Kyle McKay reads and adopts John Taylor's reasoning in the response that John Taylor writes to Parley Pratt. And that reasoning consists of, if the church was true six months ago, it's true today. If Joseph Smith was a prophet six months ago, he's a prophet today. That is an absolute non sequitur. It does not follow. It is illogical. It is irrational to say that anything other than perhaps a rock, anything at one point in time is going to be the same and actually must be the same six months later, especially when you're talking about people. For instance, I was the junior missionary companion to Elder McKay. He was my very first senior companion once I got to Japan. He was my training missionary. But just because Kyle was my senior companion back in January of 1980 does not mean that he is still my senior companion today. In fact, he wasn't my senior companion six months later. Now, if anything, the junior companion has become the senior companion. The student has become the teacher. Now, I could obviously multiply examples along this line, including the idea that because I was a true believing Mormon who served a full-time mission to Japan and had Elder McKay as a companion during that mission, that must therefore mean that I remain today a true believing and faithful member of the LDS Church. All I'm trying to show is that the basic premise that John Taylor uses to refute Parley Pratt is itself illogical and irrational. To say that Joseph Smith was a prophet at one point in time, even if correct, does not mean that he was a prophet still six months later. In order to come to that conclusion, you would have to say that Joseph Smith is more like a rock than a human being, that Joseph Smith has no agency, he has no freedom to choose, he has no power to act, but only to be acted upon. Because if we invest Joseph Smith, with the freedom to choose, then of course he could make choices that would make it so that he was no longer a prophet six months after he was a prophet. 
This becomes especially problematic within the context of Kyle's talk because shortly he's going to spend a significant portion of his talk talking about how critical it is that every one of God's children has agency, has the freedom to choose, and that God will never violate a person's freedom to choose. The obvious contradiction is that now he is quoting an argument approvingly by John Taylor, which necessarily removes from Joseph Smith the ability to choose. The young Canadian convert was John Taylor. Oh my gosh, it was John Taylor? Are you kidding me? And his response to Parley was instrumental in Parley's quick return to the church. John Taylor and Parley P. Pratt were both young adults at the time. And I'm underscoring this fact that they were both young adults at the time to try and get my message across to the young adults that I hope are paying any attention to what it is I'm saying. Each was faced with what might have been a compelling reason to doubt. It's a good thing I went over all those details on the Parley Pratt story so we could understand that, yes, he actually really did have compelling reasons to doubt. It's not just something that he might have had. He had them in spades. I marvel at John's strength to stay, and I marvel at Parley's courage and humility to return. Well, at least here's one point on which Kyle and I can agree, because I marvel that Parley Pratt returned to the church as well. As you increase your efforts to increase your testimony, you are likely to become confronted with reasons to doubt. This is a peculiar statement by Kyle McKay. Why is it that if somebody starts taking steps to strengthen their testimony, they are likely to encounter compelling reasons to doubt? Is it because part of strengthening their testimony might have to do with reading their scriptures more closely? Is it because part of strengthening their testimony might have to do with learning more about church history? It sounds to me like Kyle is saying that it's almost a given that as you start studying the scriptures, as you start studying the lives of the prophets, as you start studying church history, you are likely going to be faced with compelling reasons to doubt. I wonder why that would be. President Nelson cautioned, quote, don't pollute your testimony with false philosophies of unbelieving men and women, close quote. Apparently, then, it's A-OK -okay to pollute your testimony with the false philosophies of believing men and women. A, eh, President Nelson? Please hear me and understand. There will always be some reason or another to doubt the truthfulness of this church and gospel. Kyle McKay says this as if it's some sort of absolute law, that there will always be a reason to doubt the truth of the gospel. I have no idea why that should have to be the case. Is it a law that there must always be a reason to doubt whether the sky is blue? Is it a law that there must always be some reason to doubt that I myself exist? Is it a law that there must always be a reason to doubt that I'm speaking into a microphone and recording a podcast right now? And so we can see that it must therefore follow that just because Mormonism is true does not necessarily mean that there must exist reasons to doubt its truthfulness. But the very fact that Kyle McKay, the church historian, feels that he needs to go there to make this argument indicates clearly that he has nothing positive to say as far as evidence that the church is actually true. He has ceded that ground to the opposition. He has admitted that the reasons to doubt Mormonism are compelling, so he is reduced to playing a purely defensive game. And now he's going to set forth what the rules of that game are. And surprisingly, they have nothing to do with reasons, argument, evidence, or rationality. There are arguments and evidence supporting the proposition that there is no God, that Jesus was just a good philosopher teacher, that Joseph Smith was simply a charismatic storyteller, and that this church and gospel are not true. Here, Kyle seems to be trying to make the argument that there is just as little evidence to believe in God or to believe in Jesus Christ as the divine Son of God as there is to believe that Mormonism is truly Jesus' restored gospel. The problem is that this argument might work on somebody who does believe in God or does believe that Jesus is the Christ because it helps them see that they are built on the same sort of shaky foundation evidence-wise as those who believe that Mormonism is the correct religion. The problem with this argument, however, is that if we take it to heart as members of the church, 
And then we do our study and we learn about church history and we learn about what the church leaders are doing in the here and now, as well as in the there and then, and we lose our testimony of Mormonism, then if we take this reasoning to heart, we're also going to lose our testimony of the existence of God and that Jesus is his son. They are all tied together inextricably in this package that Elder McKay presents to us. And indeed, it might have some explanatory power at that because it may help to explain why it is that predominantly when Mormons leave the church, they also become atheists. It is because of expressions such as this made by church leaders on a continuous basis over the decades that tie belief in God and belief in Jesus to belief in Joseph Smith and belief in Mormonism, such that when Mormons lose faith in the one, they almost necessarily are trained by the LDS church to lose faith in the other. This evidence, these arguments, are on some level appealing and believable, for there are many who believe them. This statement as well is a remarkable concession on the part of the church historian, but really it's nowhere near as remarkable as the first one where he says that there are compelling reasons to doubt Mormonism. All he's saying here is that there are reasons to doubt any of these propositions, and they must be believable because there are people who believe them. I really don't think he should allow himself to go down this path much further because what he's saying to the students at BYU-Idaho is that it is completely believable to accept that there is no God, there's no Jesus, there's no Joseph Smith, and there's no Mormonism, or at least that none of these things are true as they are presented by believers in those things. The existence of such evidence and arguments should neither surprise nor shake you. If Elder McKay has not jumped the shark yet in this talk, this is where he jumps the shark. He is going to act as if it should be no great surprise to anybody to find out that there are compelling reasons to doubt Mormonism. Really? This is where he's going to go? That we shouldn't be surprised that there are compelling reasons to doubt our faith? The faith of which he is the church historian and a general authority in? No, we shouldn't be surprised by this at all. And he's going to tell us why it is that we shouldn't be surprised by this. I invite you to read again 2 Nephi chapter 2. Yes, 2 Nephi chapter 2. This is the part of the talk that I told you about where Kyle McKay is going to weigh in heavily and at length on the importance of all people having free agency, which would presumably include Joseph Smith, which would mean that just because he was a prophet at one point does not mean that he would have to be a prophet six months later. It must needs be that there is an opposition, or in other words, an opposite in all things. Why? Because the Lord God gave unto man that he should act for himself. Wherefore, man could not act for himself, save it should be that he was enticed by the one or the other. In short, agency, that is, our ability, our responsibility to choose for ourselves, is essential in all things, including and beginning with belief. In order to preserve our agency in the matter of belief, there must be opposites from which to choose, reasons to believe and reasons to doubt. God does not give us doubts, nor is he the author of error, but he allows them because it is absolutely critical that you and I choose for ourselves to believe or not to believe. His argument, remember, is that there must be compelling reasons to doubt Mormonism because there must be opposition in all things, just like the Book of Mormon said. Well, if there must be reasons to doubt Mormonism, there must also be reasons to doubt whether it is that you and I even exist. The fact is that there do not have to be compelling reasons to doubt Mormonism. If Mormonism were actually true, and if the Book of Mormon were actually a historical record about real people who lived in real time and real places in the real old New World, then we would expect that there would be a plethora of archaeological evidence supporting that assertion. And yet, there is no evidence to support that assertion. And in fact, the evidence that we have, and here I'm thinking of DNA evidence, tends to prove that assertion to be wrong. 
So ultimately, even though Elder McKay is going to try and frame this as equal amounts of evidence on both sides so that we have the freedom to choose which we're going to believe, the reality is that he is encouraging members to continue to believe in the truth claims of Mormonism, not only in the absence of any evidence to show that they are correct, but to continue to believe in the truth claims of Mormonism, even in the face of compelling reasons to believe that they are not correct. There will never come a time, at least premillennium, when God removes all reason to doubt, for to do so would be to remove all agency in the matter of belief, and he will never do that. Don't you just love it when people read God's mind in order to justify why it is that there are so many reasons to doubt their own religious beliefs? Of course God is going to allow there to be reasons to doubt Mormonism, because otherwise it would take away people's agency to choose to believe or not to believe. But honestly, if God is really behind this, and this is really the game that God is playing, why is it that he's stacking the deck so much against Mormonism that there are compelling reasons to doubt Mormonism is true? That doesn't seem fair. It's like God is intentionally placing so much evidence on the negative side of the proposition that you'd have to be a mind-numbed robot to stay in Mormonism. This isn't a case of the evidence being 50-50 on the proposition of whether Mormonism is true. It's like 99% to 1%. How does God expect the members of his church to stay members of his church with odds like that? Now, I want to be clear. By acknowledging the existence of reasons to doubt, I am not legitimizing them. And I am certainly not advocating or excusing doubt itself. Here I have to differ with you, Kyle, because actually you have legitimized reasons to doubt. You have said that there are compelling reasons to doubt the truth of Mormonism. You have said that these reasons must be believable because people do believe them. And now you're going to turn around and you're going to say, no, I'm not trying to legitimize these reasons to doubt. I'm afraid that cow has already left the barn. Jesus said, doubt not. In the face of reasons to doubt, doubt not. And now you're going to prove why it is that you are qualified to sit on the scripture committee of the LDS Church by quoting from the New Testament in a manner that completely mischaracterizes what Jesus said. You're going to go to a story in the New Testament where Jesus has just been mad at a fig tree because it's putting forth its leaves and Jesus thinks naturally enough that it should have fruit, but he gets up to the fig tree, there's no fruit on it, so he curses it. And then when they're coming back the same way later that day, the apostles see that the fig tree is dead and they remark on this and Jesus says to them, doubt not. Don't marvel about what I did with this fig tree. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll be able to say unto this mountain, remove and it shall be removed. That's the context of this doubt not statement that is being quoted by Elder McKay. And you're going to take that saying from Jesus to doubt not and apply it to a situation where people are believing something, but there's compelling reasons to doubt that what they're believing is true. And you're going to use this expression from Jesus as if he's talking to people in that situation. That when you're in a situation where you are faced with compelling reasons to doubt the truth of what it is that you believe, Jesus is talking to you when he says, doubt not. This is the kind of scriptural depth and insight that made Kyle McKay an absolute lock on being included in the scripture committee for the LDS Church. And what, did you think Satan would throw up flimsy, easily dismissible reasons to doubt? No. They will be flattering and enticing. If the prince of darkness can transform himself into an angel of light, then surely he can put forth ideas and arguments that appear enlightened. Oh, so this is why there are so many compelling reasons to doubt Mormonism. Satan! He's the one who's behind it. He's the smart guy. He's the one who comes up with all the compelling reasons to doubt Mormonism. God apparently is not smarter than his 14-year-old daughter because God cannot come up with any reasons that are compelling to believe Mormonism. This is all starting to make sense now. No, seriously, when you are backed into a corner and you have to blame Satan for why it is that there are so many compelling reasons to doubt your religious beliefs, then you really need to re-examine those religious beliefs. And I mean seriously. And I mean now.
Looked at another way, at least Kyle has given us a valuable principle by which we can detect what things are from God and what things are not. You see, it's quite simple. If there are compelling reasons, and a lot of them, to disbelieve something is from God, then that thing must be from God. You can tell because there's so many compelling reasons to disbelieve it. Thanks for the safety tip, Kyle. One of Lucifer's tactics is to play upon our natural human tendency to project natural human tendencies on God, ignoring or forgetting the fact that his ways and his thoughts are different from and higher than ours. We sometimes try to create or recreate God in our image so that he and his doctrine align with our thoughts, our ways, our shifting sympathies and evolving values. Now, obviously, Kyle is talking about current social issues at this point. He's not going to name what the social issues are. He wouldn't want to get called out for actually talking about what it is he's talking about, which does make one wonder whether he has the courage of his own convictions, if he's not even willing to talk about them in public, but only hint at them in a sideways kind of manner. But nevertheless, what he's really saying here is that the people who want to create God in their own image are the people who believe crazily enough that God loves gay people just as much as he loves straight people. And that indeed that love, which is equal, should be reflected in equal treatment of gay people inside the Lord's own church. That's what he's talking about. And of course, included in that equation is trans people and other marginalized groups. I also wanted to say that this idea of accusing other people of creating God in their own image is especially ironic coming from an LDS church leader because the LDS church has a history of creating God in its own image. It is the LDS church that believes that God has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's. I mean, you couldn't get more obvious that we're creating God in our own image. It is the LDS Church that believes that God is an exalted human from a prior planet where he lived in mortality. Oh, and why do Mormons believe that? Because that's what we believe will happen to us in the future. So we're taking what we believe will happen to us in the future and applying it to God. We are creating God in our own image. And don't even get me started about God practicing polygamy. The reason God practices polygamy is because we believe still today, sub silentio, that polygamy is essential, or at least not incompatible with eternal life and being a divine and exalted God in the hereafter. If there is any group of people who have ever created God in their own image, it is the Latter-day Saints. And as an extension and continuation of this creation of God in their own image, the Latter-day Saint Church leaders who have this belief that there is something wrong and something deficient and something aberrant with homosexual behavior and trans behavior, they take that belief and guess what they do with it? They apply it to God. So what they believe about gay people and trans people becomes what God believes about gay people and trans people. The LDS Church is guilty of what it is that Kyle here is accusing others of doing. It is the leaders of the LDS Church who create God in their own image, and then they impose those beliefs that they have attributed to God, they impose those beliefs on all the other members of the church as if they originated with God and not with the leaders themselves. Discovering that God and his doctrine are not shifting or evolving, but everlasting and unchanging, can become a reason to doubt for some. Here Kyle McKay says that the very fact that God's doctrine and his ways are unchanging and eternal can become a cause of doubt for some. Well, he's talking about the people who are having trouble with the church's current stance on social issues. Why isn't the church changing? Well, the reason they're not changing, Kyle says, is because God is eternal and unchanging. And that's why it can become a cause of doubt for such people. Now, that is one argument, and it is a coherent argument at least. It might not be an argument that I agree with, but at least it's consistent. The problem now is going to become that in order to argue as an apologist for the church's continuing retrograde position, 
on gay people, trans people, and also on women. Let's not forget the women who continue to be treated as second-class citizens within the LDS church. But for an apologist to argue that the reason that God doesn't change his position on any of these social issues is because that God is unchanging and eternal, that's one argument on the social issues front. The problem is, is that that's not the only reason people are leaving. People are leaving because of social issues, but people are also leaving because of all the issues involving church history. And primarily, the issues involving church history have to do with the church changing things, whether it's changing the language and the revelations and the doctrine and covenants, whether it's changing the church narrative on how Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon, whether it's the church changing on its position on polygamy, on its position on blacks not being able to hold the priesthood or go to the temple, and why those doctrines were there even in the first place. The fundamental problem that people have with issues related to church history have to do with the changes that were made. So in other words, if you're going to argue <laughs> if you're going to argue that the reason that the church doesn't change its position on social issues is because God is unchanging, well, now you've got to deal with church history in which you're dealing with the fact that God is changing all over the place and trying to come up with reasons to explain it. So in sum, the problem with being an apologist, one of the many problems with being an apologist for the LDS Church, is that in order to explain God's position on not changing on social issues, you have to argue that he's not changing. But when it comes to church history issues, you have to come up with reasons to explain why it is that God is always changing. Those are two arguments that should never be contemplated by the same person at the same time. They are mutually contradictory and usually you will find a speaker talking about one or the other and never both of them together because that would achieve critical mass and there would be a large mushroom shaped cloud from the podium. But Elder McKay, undaunted by this peril, is nevertheless going to actually go into the other issue when he spends a large segment at the end of his talk discussing the priesthood and temple ban as it relates to Jane Manning James, you honestly cannot make up this stuff. This is a slow-moving train wreck of a talk. I have never heard anything like it in my entire life, which is why I'm spending all this time thinking about it and giving you my thoughts in this podcast. Another of Satan's strategies is to use human error to disprove or diminish God's truth. At this point in his talk, Elder McKay is going to make a protracted argument based upon a false equivalence. He is going to talk on and on about mistakes that leaders of the church have made. Now, he's not going to say what those mistakes are, but he's going to talk about them in the abstract, as if people leave the church when they discover that church leaders have made simple mistakes. He is not going to say one word about the intentional acts that leaders of the church have done, that cause members to leave the church when they discover them, no, from his point of view, they are all simply mistakes. And thereby hangs the false equivalence in which he's engaging. He's equating mistakes with intentional harmful acts. Or, if not harmful, at least intentional acts that cast doubt upon the claims of the church that these leaders are indeed prophets, seers, and revelators. And to start out, he's going to engage in the age-old tradition of blaming the members. The leaders are never to be blamed, only the members. And he'll start out by talking to these students at BYU-Idaho and telling them that it is almost certain that at some point in their life they have said or done something, they have made some kind of mistake that has caused others to doubt. And so therefore, if you do something that causes someone else to doubt, that's no different than a leader of the church doing something that causes someone to doubt. Don't believe me? Listen for yourself. Brace yourself. It is possible, even likely, that you have said or done something that has become someone else's reason to doubt. And that argument might have some merit if indeed the students at BYU-Idaho were holding themselves out to be prophets, seers, and revelators with a direct pipeline to God. We sometimes have an unrealistic expectation that God must somehow search out or raise up errorless people to do His work and lead His church. No, actually, nobody has that unrealistic expectation that leaders of the church should be perfect human beings. 
This is simply another logical fallacy now that Kyle is engaged in. I think he's going for the Olympic record in this talk and he might just make it, folks. But this logical fallacy is called a straw man argument. He sets up a straw man that people are leaving the church because of an unrealistic expectation they have that the leaders of the church should be perfect. That's bogus. That's not true. That's a straw man. And so when he can defeat the straw man, he stands back and pretends that he's won an argument when actually he hasn't won anything. All he's done is defeated the argument that he himself created and then put into the mouth of his opponents. That's what a straw man argument is. By this point in his talk, I am not sure if I am disappointed more in Kyle because we used to be missionary companions together in Japan or if I'm more disappointed in him because he's a fellow attorney. There is no attorney in the world who would ever make these kind of arguments. These are not the arguments he learned in law school. These are not the arguments that he briefed and argued during his 20-year career as a lawyer. He would be laughed out of court if he made any of these arguments in that context. Your Honor, I want you to ignore all the compelling reasons that the opposing counsel has for believing that their side of the argument is true. And instead, I want you to stare down those compelling reasons and just believe me because, dang it, it feels right, doesn't it? And this is one of the other problems about Mormonism, is that Mormonism seems to have a habit of causing its members to abandon periodically all the ethics and all the morals and all the rules of conduct that they are required to follow in their particular career or avocation. This is a classic example of that. You're familiar with a statement made in 1890 by Wilford Woodruff. He said, quote, The Lord will never permit me or any other man who stands as president of this church to lead you astray. If I were to attempt that, the Lord would remove me out of my place, close quote. And this argument is based upon the logical fallacy that is called circular reasoning. We know that the prophet will never lead the church astray. Why? Because the prophet said that the prophet will never lead the church astray. Nice work, Kyle. What does that statement mean to you? You mean beside it being a classic example of circular reasoning? Unfortunately, some have interpreted or distorted it to mean that the Lord will never allow church leaders to make a mistake. That is simply not the case. It has never been the case. And I am unaware of anybody anywhere at any time ever making that argument. Kyle is so busy constructing his straw man that he's unaware that it has no connection with reality. The scriptures repeatedly show that God does his work through humans, and those humans make mistakes, sometimes even while God is using them for his purposes. Once again, mistakes are not the issue, Kyle. It is intentional acts by the leaders of the LDS Church. Consider how many times in the Old Testament God used mistake-prone people to establish or preserve his covenant and guide, sustain, and deliver his covenant people. Then there's Peter, the ear-cutter offer of the New Testament, who denied Christ. Given his behavioral history, how could the church he led possibly be true? And yet it was. And finally, there's Joseph Smith, mistake-prone at times, just like the ancients, But God called and magnified him in the greatest restoration of truth ever. Well, we knew it was just a matter of time before Kyle got around to Joseph Smith. He's first established that everybody in his audience has made mistakes that cause people to doubt. Now he's talking about all the mistakes that were made by the people in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Now he's going to get to Joseph Smith. That was the whole point in bringing up all these mistakes that people make because Joseph Smith made mistakes too. Now, it's not the mistakes that Joseph Smith made that I find disconcerting. Let's take the Kirtland Bank scandal as an example. I find it admirable that Joseph Smith felt that he could start a bank, that he had the chutzpah to engage in that process and try and do it for the benefit of the saints, if it were really for the benefit of the saints and not for the benefit of his own pocketbook. But honestly, a guy who goes out and tries greatly and fails greatly is to be admired in some respect for trying it all. That's a mistake. It's a big mistake, but it's just a mistake. I give Joseph Smith a total pass on that. And not just a pass, 
I give him props for even trying. The problem isn't that Joseph Smith made a mistake in establishing a bank that ultimately failed within a year of its founding because it was entirely mismanaged. The reason I have a problem with it is because Joseph Smith prophesied in the name of the Lord that the bank would be a success. And he promised his followers in the name of the Lord that if they contributed to the foundation and the start of this bank, that they would be blessed monetarily. And when those things did not happen, and those predictions and promises made by Joseph Smith in the name of the Lord were not fulfilled, and all the people who believe those predictions and promises end up empty-handed and declaring bankruptcy, yeah, that's when I have a problem with it. That's the difference between a mistake and an intentional act. And it appears that I'm not the only one who has a problem with it, because it seems like a lot of members of the church, including Parley P. Pratt, had a big problem with it as well. And what about you? If the truthfulness of this church or the truthfulness of your beliefs were judged by your errors, would anyone ever believe what you believe? Would there have been fewer mistakes, fewer messes, if God had only restored his church and gospel through you? So what do we do with error? Apparently, Kyle has used the word mistake so much that he's going to change it to a synonym and now just start talking about human error. Different term, same straw man. You can't hide or hide from the humanness of humans, but it is equally unproductive to seek out error and wallow in it by making it an emphasis of study. Learning about the errors or mistakes that church leaders have made will not increase our faith in the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, learning about them and focusing on them is a bad thing to do. However, if we're just trying to figure out what the truth of the matter is, then yeah, we have to look at their mistakes as well as the things they did right. We have to have the entire picture in front of us before we can make an informed decision. And an informed decision is exactly what it is that Kyle McKay does not want the members to make for themselves. You will never come to know and understand the truths of God by studying the errors of man. But is it just possible, Kyle, that by studying the errors of the leaders of the church, we might be able to figure out that the church is not really God's church at all? Nor has God appointed you or me or anyone to be an ongoing arbiter of error in his leaders, scrutinizing every word or act of apostles and prophets to make sure they fit within our current understanding of correctness. That is not his plan. That is not his order. Thank you for reminding us that in the LDS Church, members have no right, no ability, no authority to look into the church history to see what errors leaders of the church made and make their own freaking decision as to whether they really represent God and are his prophets and apostles. This is not, repeat, not something that members of the church have the authority to do. Thank you for the reminder, Elder McKay. What then creates a foundation that is sure and certain, regardless of reasons to doubt. This should be good, folks, because Elder McKay is now going to tell us what it is that we should do to stare down all those compelling reasons that exist to doubt the truth of Mormonism. Is it based on other evidence? Is it based on other reasons? No, not at all. It's based on your feelings. It's based on your testimony. Well, if we acquire truth and testimony line upon line, I ask you, what is your bottom line, your foundational line? If it is not Jesus Christ, I invite you to make it Jesus Christ immediately. Remember, remember that it is upon the rock of our Redeemer, who is Christ, the Son of God, that ye must build your foundation, a foundation whereon, if you build, you cannot fall. And of course, when Elder McKay says that the bottom line and the basis of your testimony should be Jesus Christ, he actually means the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's what your testimony has to be based upon. Jesus is not enough, because just Jesus could mean any Christian church. It's got to be this Jesus, this church, this religion. Don't believe me? Keep listening. 
Those who build upon Jesus Christ will not, cannot fall. Those who do not build upon Jesus Christ ultimately will not be able to stand or withstand. Way to blame those members who have looked at those compelling reasons to doubt and agreed with you, Kyle, that they are in fact compelling, and because they're compelling, they've left the church. Now you're going to blame them because they just didn't have enough faith. If they'd had more faith, then they could have withstood those compelling reasons and continued to live in a state of mindless, unthinking conformity. In other words, Mormonism. Little wonder, then, that President Nelson has invited you to, quote, make the continual strengthening of your testimony of Jesus Christ your highest priority, and then watch for miracles to happen in your life, close quote. Now Kyle McKay is a little bit concerned that President Nelson has maybe oversold this idea about building your faith in Christ and promising miracles in your life. Kyle McKay knows that there aren't really any miracles anymore in the church, if there ever were. And so he's going to redefine the word miracles that President Nelson used in order to make miracles something that happen every day. In other words, miracles are defined as something that isn't really miraculous at all. Once again, it's another shifting of definitions. I testify that the greatest miracle is the changing of a heart, the complete conversion of a soul. Nice redefinition of the word miracles there, Kyle. We wouldn't want anybody to get the idea that they actually might see real miracles in their lives, would we? In order to receive a sure and unshakable witness of Jesus Christ, we must, as President Nelson urged, do the spiritual work required to receive such a witness. Apparently, Kyle cannot quote President Nelson enough. But in this quote, it raises the question— What the heck does President Nelson mean by doing the spiritual work necessary? He never says what it means. It's just some kind of principle that he can put out there and say, if you do the spiritual work necessary, whatever it means, then your testimony will grow. And if your testimony doesn't grow, then it means that you didn't do the spiritual work that was necessary, whatever that means. It's almost like they're hedging their bets or something. This work most assuredly includes intently studying the Book of Mormon. Okay, at least we know that this spiritual work includes studying the Book of Mormon. Thanks for the clarification, Kyle. But circling back to something else you said earlier in your talk, why is it your position that if people intently study the Book of Mormon as part of doing the spiritual work to increase their faith, why is it that that is going to almost necessarily lead to encountering reasons to doubt whether Mormonism is true? You don't explain that anywhere in your talk, Kyle. Sometimes in studying the Book of Mormon or presenting it to others, we are tempted to bypass its primary purpose and jump straight to the collateral conclusion that if the Book of Mormon is true, Joseph Smith is a prophet, and this is God's church. These are logical, accurate conclusions. No, actually, they're not, Kyle. Those conclusions are neither logical nor accurate. If Joseph Smith were a prophet, and if the Book of Mormon really is the Word of God, it in no way is logical that the church today is God's church. It is in no way accurate that it must mean that today's church is God's church. You are once again falling into the trap of arguing that just because something is one way at one point in time, it must remain that way forever after. It can never change. You've made this mistake before, and once again, this position means that you are arguing that Joseph Smith and none of the church leaders, none of the church presidents since Joseph Smith have had any free agency to choose. They've never had the ability to actually make a choice that would lead the church astray. And therefore, today's church must be true just the way it was back in Joseph Smith's day. At least, that's your argument. And once again, this argument contradicts the extended argument you made based upon 2 Nephi chapter 2 that all men have agency. And in fact, God will never, ever interfere with the use of man's agency. This is why I call this talk a slow motion train wreck. But that's not the only way I can prove that what you just said was neither logical nor accurate. There are a host of other churches out there that all claim Joseph Smith is their founding prophet, that all claim the Book of Mormon is restored scripture, and yet they are not the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints with headquarters in Salt Lake City. They are not 
the Brighamite Mormon branch. If your argument were correct, that Joseph Smith being a prophet necessarily leads to this church that he founded being true, then that argument could be made by any of the other restoration offshoots with equal validity. But it is not valid, it is not correct, and it is not logical, which I have just proven by giving the counterexample of all the other restorationist offshoots. But I invite you to read the book for its primary purpose, to convince the people of this earth that Jesus is the Christ. Well, according to the title page of the Book of Mormon, which you are obliquely referencing, the Book of Mormon was actually written primarily to the Lamanites. Here's the first line. Wherefore, it is an abridgment of the record of the people of Nephi and also of the Lamanites, written to the Lamanites, who are a remnant of the house of Israel, and also to Jew and Gentile. Primarily, first up, is it's written to the Lamanites. But since the church no longer knows who the Lamanites are or where they're to be found, I guess it's just as well that Kyle doesn't mention that part, but says only that it's written to all the people of the world. I promise that as you do this with an open, honest heart, you will have an experience with Jesus that you have never had before. It will be sweet, convincing, and lasting, and you will become converted unto the Lord. And here comes Kyle with the standard general authority promise about the Book of Mormon that if you read it with an open and honest heart, you will receive a testimony of Jesus Christ. And if you read the Book of Mormon and don't receive a testimony of Jesus Christ, well, the fault's on you, pal, because you obviously did not have an open and honest heart. With a naturally occurring desire to become united unto his church. See how Kyle slips that in? If you read the Book of Mormon and you get a testimony of Jesus Christ, then you will obviously have a natural desire to join his church. What church is that, Kyle? Oh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We're not really talking about Jesus here and being converted to him at all. Conversion to Jesus in Mormonism is just a stepping stone to joining the Mormon church. When you ask God, the Eternal Father, if these things are true, if Jesus is the Christ, if this is his gospel, it is essential that you ask in faith. Okay, this is starting to get complicated, Kyle. Not only do I have to have an open heart and a sincere heart, no, 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 an open heart and an honest heart, I also have to ask in faith. So if and when I don't get the testimony that you're promising me in the name of the Lord I will receive, then it's on me because I obviously didn't do something Right, I didn't fulfill one of these conditions sufficiently to have that promise actually be fulfilled. You know, in some ways, you really are starting to sound like a lawyer. Asking, and for that matter, reading from a position of doubt or skepticism, will not summon a response from heaven. Dang it, so there's more conditions to this too. I can read the Book of Mormon, but I have to read it in the right way and from the right position. I can't read it from a point of view of doubt or skepticism because God will not answer any kind of prayer from that point of view. Now, why it is that God, the Omnipotent One, the Creator of heaven and earth and all of the universe is unable to answer a prayer just because it comes from someone with a doubt about what it is they're reading in the Book of Mormon, why God can't override that doubt and manifest to them in unmistakable terms that this This book really is the word of God goes unanswered. In Mormonism, God's omnipotence gets hedged in time and time again until he becomes impotent and ineffective. It's kind of like what happens to Pennywise the Clown at the end of the movie It. Nobody wants to play with the clown. Prove it to me prayers are seldom answered. And if they are, it is usually to the condemnation, even destruction, of the one demanding proof. Think Korahor and Sherem, for example. It's funny because I'm thinking of Paul the Apostle and Alma the Younger, who went around not just from a position of doubt, but active defiance and disobedience of the Lord and all of his teachings. And yet, nevertheless, in spite of that, God was able to override that by sending an angel to them to let them know that they were wrong and they needed to change their ways. But I guess that's just a story because the reality, as Elder McKay tells us, is that if we read the Book of Mormon from a position of doubt, then God will not answer any prayer as to whether it's true. 
This is yet another example of how it is that modern Mormonism contradicts the Book of Mormon at every turn of the road. Asking in faith, even a particle of faith, implies that you at least have a desire to believe. Lead with this desire and let it work in you. Okay, on one side of the equation, we have compelling reasons to disbelieve Mormonism and the Book of Mormon. And on the other side, we have a teeny tiny particle of faith. We have a desire to believe that Mormonism is true and that the Book of Mormon is the word of God. Guess who wins in that match? Compelling reasons every time. Asking in faith also means that you believe God will answer your prayers and give you the knowledge you desire. And guess what? If you believe God is going to answer your prayers, then God is going to answer your prayers. Psychology 101. This faith is often demonstrated by what you do after you ask. Waiting patiently, unwaveringly, for the witness you desire is part of asking in faith. Oh my gosh, Kyle is now going to try and carve out a space for all the people who read the Book of Mormon with an open and an honest heart. They did it with a desire to believe. They read it with faith. They asked God if it were true, and they don't get an answer. So what do we do with that? Well, you just have to keep waiting. How long? I don't know. It's up to God. It could be a long time. It could be a short time. It could be never. But what you have to do to show that you really desire to believe that God will answer your prayer positively and tell you that the Book of Mormon is true, to really show that you believe that, you've got to wait for an indefinite period of time that may never end in order to give God a chance to answer your prayer. Because, you know, God's very busy. There's a lot of stuff to do in the universe. There's a lot of people on this planet. He's very, very busy. And he may not be able to get back to your prayer, I don't know, within the next thousand years or so. So you just hang in there. You just keep doing what it is that you're supposed to do, i.e. what we tell you to do. Everything will be fine. And you will ultimately receive your witness that the Book of Mormon is true. Even if it's after this life is over, hey, that's not too long to wait. You just keep doing what it is that you're supposed to be doing as a good Mormon and everything will work out fine, believe me. Now remember, remember that this is the position that Kyle McKay is putting in opposition to compelling reasons to doubt. And yet he thinks that waiting indefinitely, forever perhaps, to get any kind of an answer from God is superior in some way or should trump or stare down all those compelling reasons. I think that's an unreasonable position to take, and I think that's putting it mildly. Trying to understand the things of God by some way other than the Spirit of God is like trying to understand the flavor of food by listening to it. You're using the wrong sense. You're right, Kyle. We can never understand God by using the common sense that God gave us in the first place. If we neglect our spiritual sense of learning and feeling, we will never adequately know God's truth. In fact, without the Spirit of God, the things of God will probably seem foolish. Paul confirmed this. He said, quote, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Close quote. And taking that argument to its logical conclusion, it means that the more foolish something is, the more likely it is to be from God. So now we can add this idea, this concept, this principle that the more foolish something is, the more likely it is to be true. We can add that to the principle that Kyle has already taught us, that the more overwhelming the evidence is against a certain proposition, the more likely that proposition is to be true. There's no way that argument could be dangerous in the wrong hands. The language of the spirit has been described as original, but inarticulate, heard only with the soul. And just why is it, Kyle, that the language of the Spirit has to be inarticulate? If this is the God of the universe, the one who ostensibly wants to communicate with us, why doesn't he do it quickly and why doesn't he do it in a manner that is easily understood? 
Why doesn't he speak to us in our own language like Joseph Smith said God spoke to him in his? What is the problem? It almost sounds like what you're saying is that God isn't really behind this and God isn't really communicating. All we're doing is talking about feelings that we have in our heart and assigning those to God. And therefore, because that must be God speaking to us, he is inarticulate because he only speaks in terms of feelings. This is starting to sound like the tail wagging the dog. Without some level of fluency in this language of the Spirit, you cannot know the foundational truths you must know so that you cannot fall. I urge you to become acquainted with and fluent in the sweet language of the Spirit. Okay, so we've got to become fluent in a language that you have already told us is inarticulate. Got it, Kyle. Now, finally, it is likely that the light and knowledge you need, the witness you desire to make your foundation sure and certain, will descend gradually, as it did upon the boy Joseph. Now, here, of course, Kyle goes into the old general authority church leader trope that once you get your answer to your prayer, I mean, once God finally gets around to answering your prayer, which may happen in this life, it may happen in the next life, God only knows. But once God does start getting around to answering that prayer, it is not going to be miraculous. It is not going to be sudden. It is not going to be something that you can actually point to and say, this happened, and this is why I know my prayer was answered. Instead, it's something that's going to happen gradually over a period of years until finally you realize that you've received your testimony. It's something that happens so gradually you don't even know it's happening. Or as I sometimes put it, it happens so gradually that you don't know that it's not happening. You don't know that you're not receiving an answer to your prayer. The thing that is strange about this, though, is the spin that Kyle puts on it now, which is that he likens the gradual answering of your prayer, so gradual you don't even know it's happening, to Joseph Smith's first vision, which of course he's referencing when he says, it will descend upon you gradually as it did upon Joseph. The only difference is, and I would expect the church historian would know this, is that that line comes from Joseph Smith's recounting of his first vision, a vision he claimed he saw God the Father and Jesus Christ, both in this vision. That's instantaneous. That is an answer to prayer. That is a vision. And why is it that Joseph Smith and other early members of the church received these kinds of visions, received these kinds of answers to their prayer, received these kinds of amazing spiritual gifts when they are nowhere to be found among the members of the church today and certainly not among the leadership of the church today, at least not judging by the stories that they tell the members of the church twice a year in general conference. And nothing underscores that point better than what Kyle McKay just did by using Joseph Smith's first vision as evidence for why it is that you may take years and years until you get an answer to your prayer. And even when you get it, you won't even be aware that you're receiving it until suddenly you wake up one day and say, oh my gosh, I have a testimony. Is it any wonder that there are many Mormons who are coming to believe that the LDS church is in a state of apostasy? It will come over time and in increments. But I promise you that these increments will aggregate into a witness of Jesus Christ and his gospel that will be sure and certain, even as reasons to doubt continue to swirl and hiss about you daily. Okay, Kyle, so assuming for the sake of argument that everything you're telling me is on the up and up and that I will receive a testimony in a matter of years and decades through this incremental process that you describe, how on earth is that supposed to be of any earthly help to me in dealing with all of these horrible swirling things that are surrounding me, these doubts that you say are attacking me on a daily basis? Why do I have to wait for decades to get a testimony that I need today? What's up with that? Brothers and sisters, I hope you realize that having perplexing questions that arise from reasons to doubt is not a problem. But please understand, finding answers to these perplexing questions ultimately is not the solution. This is the other quote for the ages that my former missionary companion, Kyle McKay, 
gives to us. Of course, finding the answers to a problem is not the solution. Where else in life would we ever think that finding the answers to a problem would be a solution? I mean, isn't that really what problems are all about and solving problems? We get an answer to the problem, which means we've solved it. But now Kyle is going to play some mental gymnastics, mumbo jumbo, George Orwellian kind of malarkey and actually expect us to believe him when he says that finding the answers to a problem is not the solution? Well, if finding the answers to problems is not the solution, what is the solution, Kyle? Oh, he's going to tell us. It's this process of praying and waiting around for God to answer your prayer. And when God gets around to answering your prayer, if he ever gets around to answering your prayer, he's going to take years and decades to slowly, incrementally give you little bit, little bit, little bit of your testimony, so little that you won't even know it's happening. So incremental, you won't even be aware that anything's going on. That's the answer that you have, the answer that is the solution, not the answers to the problems themselves. This is the super solution that you're proposing. Well, I've got to tell you, Kyle, the super solution isn't sounding too convincing to me. I don't know, maybe I'm the only one, but it's not persuading me. It's certainly not the compelling reasons that you've already told us exist on the other side of the equation. The solution is a sure and certain foundation whereon if you build, you cannot fall. That foundation is Jesus Christ and his gospel, the fullness of which is found and taught here in his church. See, I told you that was the super solution. And once again, Kyle McKay wants to make it clear that any testimony of Jesus is the same as a testimony of his church. They're like love and marriage. They go together like a horse and carriage. I close by sharing the unshakable witness of someone who built upon a sure and certain foundation. Yeah, every testimony is unshakable until it's not. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. This is the place where now at the end of his talk, Elder McKay is going to tell the story of Jane Manning James. He's going to tell the story of how faithful she was because she stayed in the church and went west with the saints. And over a period of decades, she repeatedly requested from presidents of the church permission for her to be able to enter the temple and receive the ordinances of exaltation, i.e. the ordinances that will allow her to return to where God and Jesus dwell. And time after time, her requests to enter the temple are denied by all of these church presidents. And the reason she is denied is because of one reason and one reason only, and that is the color of her skin. Yes, Elder McKay is actually going to go to this story. Now, the use of this story is remarkable for a number of reasons. And the first reason it's remarkable is because Kyle, in the same talk, has just earlier said that God is never going to change on social issues. And yet, now he's going to use the story of Jane Manning James to show that God does change on social issues. Oh, he may not change for a number of decades, but finally he gets around to it and he changes his mind. This story completely undercuts the assertion he made toward the beginning that God never changes. The second reason this story is an unusual choice for Elder McKay is because Jane Manning James did not simply take what the first president of the church told her for her answer. She didn't just go once and ask the president of the church if she could receive her endowment and go in the temple and then get rebuffed on the basis that she's black. No, she didn't take that as gospel. She continued to petition the church and subsequent church presidents over and over again. I am certain that this is not what Elder McKay intended his story to mean and to illustrate, but it's pretty obvious to me that that is exactly what is going on. No, I think that what Elder McKay wants to get across in telling the story is that nobody has suffered as much abuse as Jane Manning James did from presidents of the church, so you should go and do likewise. And this is the same fundamental message as the story Kyle told us about Parley P. Pratt earlier. Parley P. Pratt suffered abuse at the hands of Joseph Smith. Parley P. Pratt came back to church. It's the same message. No matter how much abuse you have to suffer from church leaders, you stay faithful. And if you've left the church, you come back to church. There is no amount of abuse that you can suffer that justifies you leaving the church. Got it? There is no way that you've received more abuse than Jane Manning did from leaders of the church. Therefore, you need to suffer through any and all abuse that you receive from leaders of the church, and you need to stay faithful 
too. If Jane Manning James could do it, so can you. Listen to Kyle tell this story and see if you don't agree with me. In the winter of 1842, a young single adult named Jane Elizabeth Manning joined the church in Connecticut. With several other converts, including some of her own family, she made the thousand-mile journey to Nauvoo, most of it on foot. Upon hearing of her arduous journey and unrelenting faith, the Prophet Joseph declared to a friend, What do you think of that? Isn't that faith? Jane endured persecutions with the saints in Nauvoo. She felt wrenching grief when Joseph and Hiram were murdered. She crossed the plains in 1847 and became a beloved friend and minister in the Salt Lake Valley for decades. Sorry to break into this riveting story, but what is with calling Jane Manning James a minister when she was in Salt Lake City? That implies that she has some kind of priesthood or church authority when she had neither. That was what the whole issue was about. She's black. She's a woman. She can't hold the priesthood for both reasons, and yet you're going to call her a minister in Salt Lake City? That's just weird, Kyle. Weird and a little misleading. She rejoiced in the doctrine of the temple and contributed to its construction. Yes, and in spite of her rejoicing in the temple, and in spite of her contributing to the building of the temple, she could not actually enter into the temple herself. Why? Because she had the wrong colored skin. But Jane was not able to receive the highest blessings of the temple, because she was black. Whoa, Kyle, you actually said it. Well, good on you for that much at least. But here we have the spectacle of a woman who is a faithful member of the church, who showed faith in every footstep, who did everything she possibly could to manifest her faithfulness and her worthiness, but she cannot enter the temple because she's black. And why is that a barrier to her entering the temple? Because God has told his prophets that nobody who's black can enter into the temple. That is why she can't enter the temple, because it is the revelation and the will of God as manifest to the saints through his appointed servants, the prophets, from Brigham Young all the way down to Spencer W. Kimball. That was the word and the will of the Lord. So, you see, it's not the leaders of the church who are the racists. God is the racist, and the leaders of the church are just the bearers of bad news. At that time, members of black African descent were prohibited from participating in the endowment and sealing ordinances. Because at some times God is a racist, and at other times he's not. Sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. On December 27, 1884, Jane wrote a plaintive petition to the president of the church, whom she knew personally. Acknowledging her race and the church's policy then in place, she pleaded to be allowed to receive the blessings of the endowment and sealing. Quote, God promised Abraham that in his seed all the nations of the earth should be blessed. And as this is the fullness of all dispensations, is there no blessing for me? Her request was not granted. The church president to whom she petitioned was John Taylor. It sounds like you're getting a little bit choked up there, Kyle, but you shouldn't be crying for Jane Manning James. The people you should be crying for are the leaders of the church who refused her petitions to enter the temple and did so solely on the basis that she was black. That's who you should be crying for. He who once withstood what might have been his compelling reason to doubt now became part of what might have been Jane Manning's compelling reason to doubt. But Jane Manning James willingly suffered this discriminatory abuse for years and even decades, and therefore, so should you. And not only that, even though the church today has similar discriminatory practices and policies and doctrines against gay people and against trans people and against other marginalized people in the community, even if you are one of those people or have one of those people that is a dear friend or member of your family, you too, like Jane Manning James, should suffer that discriminatory abuse and stay faithful to the LDS Church. Am I receiving the message loud and clear, Kyle? Jane made similar petitions to Wilford Woodruff and Joseph F. Smith, who similarly upheld the race restriction at the time. 
Did you hear that? Kyle said race restriction at the time. Yes, God does change. That's why you don't want to make this argument about history and historical issues in Mormonism in the same talk that you've already addressed social issues by saying, sit tight, God knows better than you, and God's not going to change his mind. It would have been easy and understandable for Jane to pack it in, shut it down, and walk away. But she didn't. Why? Because her foundation was sure and certain in the truths that she had learned. So if your foundation is sure and certain, you can suffer the same kind of discriminatory abuse too. Near the end of her life, Jane identified by name Brigham Young, John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, Lorenzo Snow, and Joseph F. Smith, not as men who upheld the church's race restrictions for priesthood and temple blessings. Rather, she identified them as good, great, and holy men whom others should listen to and obey. Kyle, why are you pretending that you don't know that this entire situation revolved around racism? Jane Manning, James, knew that it was all about racism. She was black. That's the only reason she couldn't go to the temple. All of these prophets and leaders of the church knew it was about racism. Because she was black, she can't go to the temple. And yet now you're saying it's a big deal that Jane Manning, James, doesn't identify these presidents of the church from Brigham Young to Joseph F. Smith as racist. She doesn't have to identify them as racist. We all know they're racist. Your entire story tells us that they're racist. What difference does it make that she doesn't say that they're racist? She knows it. They know it. You know it. We all know it. Whether she identifies them as racist is not the issue. The issue is that she suffered through this racist, abusive, prophetic nightmare and yet still remained a member of the church. And that's what you want all of us to do too. Well, as for me and my house, no thanks, Kyle. Not buying. I did it for 40 years. That's enough for me. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. She died with this simple but sure testimony in her heart and on her lips. Quote, I want to say right here that my faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ as taught by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is as strong today, nay, it is, if possible, stronger than it was the day I was first baptized. Is it just me, or does anybody else find it a little bit cynical to be crying tears of admiration, respect, and joy over the plight of a woman in the LDS Church who asked over and over again of the top leaders of the church over a period of decades if she could go into a building to get her ordinances, ordinances that every other white person could go into that building and get. And yet she was rebuffed time and time and time again. I don't know. It just seems manipulative, cynical, and disingenuous to have a representative of the same power structure in the LDS church that kept her from going to the temple crying over the fact that she was so faithful, she stayed in the church in the face of this racist, abusive policy that Kyle still ascribes to God, apparently. But whether from God or not, it was enforced by the church leadership. Kyle represents that church leadership today, and he's going to cry tears of admiration and joy over the fact that Jane Manning James was somehow able to withstand with her faith the abusiveness that was thrust upon her by Kyle's predecessors in church office. I pay my tithes and offerings and keep the word of wisdom. I go to bed early and rise early. I try in my feeble way to set a good example to all. Close quote. I aspire to Jane Manning's unwavering faith. I just have to say here that I absolutely reject the LDS tendency to define such a positive attribute as faith in terms that are indistinguishable from the Stockholm Syndrome. Why is faith continuously in the LDS Church used as a quality of character that allows people to suffer monumental, unbelievable, continuing abuse 
from their own church leaders. That is not what faith is supposed to be. That is the stuff of brainwashing and mental illness, not faith. I would be honored and humbled if she would allow me to stand with her and bear testimony to you that Jesus is the living Christ, the Son of the living God, that the living God is our loving Father, and that this Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the Church, the very Church Jesus promised Peter he would build. It has been restored to the earth in these last days, never again to be thrown down. I testify that Russell M. Nelson is a good, great, and holy man, a prophet of God. I commend to you his invitation to make the continual strengthening of your testimony of Jesus Christ your highest priority. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, that completes the talk given by Kyle S. McKay, current church historian of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints at BYU-Idaho on April 25th, 2023, and my commentary thereon. I've really pretty much said everything I have to say about this talk in the commentary. I don't have a lot left to say here at the conclusion. I'm just glad to say I finally made it. It's finally over, and I can finally get this published so you can listen to it. Thanks so much for listening. That's about all for now. Until next time, this is Radio Free Mormon, signing off the air.